Hello. In this video, we're going to estimate time and length scales for advection and diffusion. So, so far we've put down a lot of equations. What I want to do is try and put some numbers to those equations and some physical understanding. So we've already really said this, if we've got advection or if it's heat transport, convection, it's basically linear flow, right? Things scale with time. You're going at a certain speed. Something's been injected. So the distance that you travel basically scales as a velocity times time, right? If it's convection, just using the, the nomenclature we had in previous videos, beta was your effective speed times time. But we're also going to look at the time scales for diffusive behaviour. Now, diffusion fundamentally comes from just random numbers, right? So taking random steps, the random motion of a solute in water, the random thermal motion of atoms. And what that leads to, it doesn't mean just because it's random motion and you're moving um, one step one way, one step the other way. Imagine drunks coming out of a pub, right? If you haven't had too much to drink and you know where you're going, you're walking home at a given speed. But if you had too much to drink and you just go one step one way, one step the other way, that's a random motion. Now, after a number of steps, you may end up back at the door of the pub, but actually, on average, you are progressing. There is a random motion, and that random motion goes as the square root of time. And mathematically, that's where that ha you have that second spatial derivative. So if we're looking at something that's diffusion, or again, in heat transport, we call that um, conduction. Right. The distance you move, and this is not a precise number, basically goes as 2 dt. The 2 is basically the standard deviation of the error function if you do the maths properly. Okay. In uh, conduction, it's the same thing, but just in terms of our nomenclature that we've used, instead of a diffusion coefficient, we use alpha. So let's look at these. Right? Let's actually evaluate those. Let's put some numbers down to sort of get, get an idea. So we're going to start with, the, funnily enough, the, the more difficult case. We're going to consider multiphase flow in porous media. So in the previous videos, we constructed analytic solutions and we looked at a velocity. And the velocity with which something moved was either our shock speed or a differential of our fractional flow. But that was a dimensionless velocity. In dimensional terms, it's the total velocity, that's the total volume injected per unit area per unit time, divided by porosity. So that's your velocity. So what are typical values here? Well, my gradients are of order one. This is not a precise calculation. Okay, we've shown how to do a precise calculation. These are just, yeah, it's of order one, right? It's a dimensionless number. It's the gradient of a of a of a function, right? Where the saturation goes between zero and one, and f goes between zero and one. So the gradients are of order one. What are typical QT values of QT and porosity? Well, in this video, I'm going to assume we have a porous medium with a porosity of twenty percent. That would represent, say, a sandstone or a carbonate reasonably deep underground. Typical Q values of QT. I'm going to take, just to begin with, 10 to the minus 6 metres per second, and then I'll explain that. So my velocities are of order 5 times 10 to the minus 6 metres per second, right? Because I just divided by 0.2. And now let's think about time. Let's imagine, well, how far would, say, water move in a year? So how many seconds in a year? Um, the way of thinking about it is three seconds is a nano century. So 100 years is three times 10 to the nine seconds. Actually, almost precisely pi times 10 to the nine seconds. Just for you to remember, um, there's no particular reason. It just the numbers come out that way. So one year, 
is about 3 times 10 to the 7 seconds. Okay, so Vt, if we're looking here, it's going to be 15 times 10 to the minus 6, 150 metres, roughly. Now let's think about this. Imagine I'm, I've got water that's moving and displacing carbon dioxide, or I'm injecting water into an oil field to dis, displace the oil. In those cases, normally we have wells that are typically a few hundred metres apart, and normally these processes take of order 10 years. So typically, actually, the waterfront is moving somewhere between 10 and maybe a few tens of metres per year. So this velocity, 10 to the minus 6 metres per second, that's sort of 10 centimetres a day, is actually on the high side. So typically velocities that we may encounter in the subsurface, even if we're injecting, right, are normally in the range maybe 10 to the minus 7, maybe getting about as high as 10 to the minus 6 metres per second, and we're moving in a year something of the order of sort of tens of metres, right, to as much as about 100 metres. Okay, so that gives you some idea. So every day there's a very small movement, it's slow flow, that's why everything at the pore scale is capillary dominated, over time, obviously, that, that accumulates, but the distance is moved to normally tens of metres to maybe about 100 metres per year. OK. What about diffusive transport? What about things that are controlled by capillary pressure? Well, let's think about this D, shall we? So this is going to be a little bit more complicated, but it gives us a sort of order of magnitude. So D, if you recall, was minus lambda 1, lambda 2 over lambda t times the permeability times a gradient in capillary pressure. OK. And actually, the way we did it, there was a phi term as well. So we do need to include, we actually re really need to look at D over phi because there's always a porosity that comes in to our equation. So it's in fact this is the object that's controlling the smearing out. So let's just look at the capillary pressure first of all. To get an order of magnitude of capillary pressure we're going to invoke a dimensionless Leverett J function scaling that's been described in uh, previous videos. So this is a typical length scale, this is an interfacial tension and then we have a dimensionless J function. And typically this J function is of order 1 for most displacement. If we have a spatial derivative of the J function, that's going to be of order 1. It's a bit like this. We have a function that's about 1 and the saturation's about 1. So don't overthink this. This is an order of magnitude. Not a precise calculation because we're going to talk about precise calculations in other videos. OK, this is just an order of magnitude. So let's think of a permeability, say, 100 millidarses. That's 10 to the minus 13 square metres. OK. An interfacial tension, let's imagine we've got motion between carbon dioxide and water. That's about 50 millinewtons per metre. If we're looking at something that's more like um, between oil and water in the subsurface, at subsurface conditions, more like 20 millinewtons per metre. So let's take say, some representative value, which is 40 millinewtons per metre, just as an example. So that's 40 times mi minus 3 newtons per metre. So we're going to assume that dj ds is just of order 1. OK, so then this d over phi term right, becomes, for just a moment, of order 1, there's a minus sign. But remember, capillary pressure decreases with saturation. So it's of order one in terms of magnitude, but don't overthink the minus sign. Now we need to think about these lambdas. Lambda is a relative permeability divided by viscosity. And as I show in a later video, when we're looking at imbibition processes, it's normally limited by the motion of the water. So the oil or the carbon dioxide or the gas that you're displacing is very mobile, 
the total mobility is lambda 1 plus lambda 2. Lambda 1 is the water mobility. This is small, this is large. So lambda 2 and lambda t basically almost cancel. And so it's limited by the relative permeability of the water. So an order of magnitude of d is going to be an order of magnitude of the water relative permeability divided by the viscosity. We've got a porosity here. We've got a k. We've got a root phi over k. And we've got a sigma. And the derivative we've said is of order 1. But just a moment, we've got a k over phi and a phi over k. So in fact, the square root goes the other way. Okay, we've got a kr, we've got a sigma, and we've got a mu. Okay, okay, so let's put some numbers in here. Okay, so maybe with a different colour, so it's a little bit clearer. So sigma we've got here is this value. Viscosity of water, certainly at ambient conditions, is about 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds. Relative permeability of water, we have imbibition being a strong effect actually when you're strongly water wet and the water's imbibing at a low saturation. So in fact, we're not going to have a relative permeability of order one, right? The, the, the water is in the small pores. Let's give it a relative permeability of say 0.1. That's going to be a typical value. Okay, and now what other terms do we have? Well, we've got the permeability. That's 10 to the minus 13. I'll leave out the square meters and that's 0.2. So that's going to be 5 times 10 to the minus 13. Now, of course, I can sit here with a calculator, but actually it's rather nice to be able to do these things um, off the top of your head. So that's 5 times 10 to the minus 13. That's 50 times 10 to the minus 14. If I find the square root, this is 10 to the minus 7. The square root of 50, well, the square root of 49 is 7. So roughly seven is it this is an order of magnitude calculation so don't over don't over stress you know that it's hand waving right i'm waving my hands it is a bit hand waving but it gets us an order of magnitude so let's put these numbers in so this is seven times ten to the minus seven is this square root we've got point one here we've got forty times ten to the minus three and we got 10 to the minus 3 here. And what we're calculating is this object, basically an effective diffusion coefficient. Right? Of course, it's nonlinear. It depends on saturation. It's much more complex, but just an order of magnitude. How far are you going um, with capillary forces? So let's have a look at this. 10 to minus 3s cancel out. OK, we've got 7 times 4, which is 28. And that becomes just one. So we've got 28 times 10 to the minus 7. So that's roughly 3 times 10 to the minus 6. Hmm. Units, it's meters squared per second. This is why you do strict SI, right? Don't try doing anything else that's sort of SI-ish, right? Strict SI, okay? Um, no, no millis, no megas, no funny other stuff, right? So I think if we look at this, we, we've considered all the terms. We've got the viscosity, we've got the porosity, the J function, we need to have a sigma. So I think we've got everything here. So um, let's do the same. How far can you go in a year? Right. So you're imbibing for a year. Um, 2D is going to be 6 times 10 to the minus 6. Right, so it's 6 times 10 to the minus 6. And t was, what, 3 times 10 to the 7. So that's going to be... 3 times 6 is 18. 180 here. Right, something like that. So what's the square root of 180? About 15, 14 metres. All right. Something like that, right? 14 squared is what? Uh, 196, 13 squared is 169. So it's maybe 13 or 14 meters, right? Yeah, this was a, was approximate. Let's make it even more approximate, right? It's, a, it's about 10 
10 meters or so. Now this is interesting because what it says is in Babishan, if you have a water wet porous medium, is sufficient actually for an imbibing front to move about 10 meters in a year. Now, of course, it's a diffusive process. So it's not gonna move 20 meters in two years, right? Um, but it is quite significant. Over time scales of up to a year, the amount of imbibition that you can have is actually comparable with the amount of advection. Now, there is a subtlety here. The subtlety is that if I'm pushing the fluid, as you know, you build up a shock. And actually, that shock is what's known as self-sharpening. So although there's a spreading out due to capillary forces, actually advective forces are trying to build back up the shock. So if we're just pushing fluid through and it's imbibing, normally, in fact, the imbibition is limited over uh, basically a length where the capillary pressure is equal to the viscous pressure difference. And that's about a metre. Right? It's basically the length scale where capillary pressures of order a few kilopascals are equal to the viscous pressure drop in Darcy's law. But if we don't have any flow, we just allow imbibition. It is, in fact, a relatively fast process, and we can move of order 10 metres in about a year. Right? So over normal time scales of subsurface operations, we are going to be imbibing, you know, in the sort of 10 to 20 metre level, and that is significant. So conclusion of this for multi-phase flow is in the subsurface, advection is slow but keeps going. You will move hundreds of metres, but it may take years or decades to do so. In Babishan, funnily enough, up to a year time scale is almost as fast as advection, right? We can, we can actually have an imbibing front that may, in permeable porous media, which are strongly water wet, um, move as much as 10 metres or so in one year. Okay, now we're going to do the same for heat transport, and that's actually going to be a little bit more straightforward. So let's just write down in the nomenclature of previous videos, X goes as beta T, okay, where beta is an effective speed. I'm going to show it's not the speed with which, say, injected hot water moves. It's the effective speed, and this is for convection, and then x scales as, and that's a scales as, to alpha t, and this is heat conduction. Now just to make it a little bit more explicit, we're going to have our phi is 0.2, as before. We're going to have our total velocity. This is actually the volume of fluid flowing per unit area per unit time. It's not an actual velocity. It's not beta. Not, not beta. OK, um, to make it a little bit more transparent, we're going to consider a case where we're, say, injecting hot water into a silica rock, into a sandstone. OK, so now we need to write down the properties that we're going to use. We're not going to have a second phase. We're only going to have one fluid phase. So we're going to have S1 is 1, S2 is 0, and this is going to be water. So let's now write down some of the properties that we're going to, to, to need to understand um, these uh, alpha and beta parameters. So let's actually write down what alpha and beta are. So alpha was for heat conduction. So it was phi times the conductivity of water plus 1 minus phi times the conductivity of the solid. And then we divided it by phi times essentially the, the heat capacity, which was a density of water times the heat capacity of water. And then we have the solid as well, the density of solid times the heat capacity of the solid. Beta is for convection. The only thing that's flowing is water. OK, so we have phi. Sorry, we, we don't have phi at all. Sorry, we don't have frosty, do we? We have QT times the heat capacity of water. 
and times the density of water. And then on the denominator, we've got exactly the same. We've got rho 1 C1 plus 1 minus phi rho S Cs. Now, the first thing you're going to see here with the velocity, you notice here the velocity is not Qt over phi because we also have the fact that the hot water is heat transport, not mass transport. We have to heat up the solid as we move along. And what that means is actually the hot water front moves slower than the injected water. So the water molecules are moving faster than the hot water front because energy is being used up to heat up the solid. And that's rather significant here. OK, so let's let's put some um, values here. So we've got porosity. We've got QT. Let's do the densities. So the density of water is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. The density of the solid, and this really is the solid, not the porous medium, because we've accounted for porosity. Um, if it's quartz, density of quartz is about 2,600 kilograms per cubic metre. It's denser. OK, so that's den density. Um, now let's look at the heat capacities, and I hope you don't mind if I have to actually look up the numbers, right? You can, you can look them up in uh, Wikipedia, um, yourself. Okay, so the, the heat capacity of water is 4.2 times 10 to the 3 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. That's hopefully the right units. The heat capacity of quartz is actually lower. Water has a very high heat capacity, so it stores a lot of heat. And of course, that's the basis of thermal energy storage or geothermal energy. So that's 7 point times 10 to the 2. That's a 3 here, and that's joules per kilogram per Kelvin, OK? Now we need to know the thermal conductivities, OK? So for water, that's 0.6 watts per metre per Kelvin. And for quartz, and this is actually quite interesting, for the solid, quartz actually has a very high um, thermal conductivity, in fact, rather higher than most uh, solids. So this is where we're very much going to, you know, find an upper, upper limit, really, on uh, heat conduction. And I think uh, we now have all the properties we need. OK, so apologise for that, but you can do the same, right? It's uh, search on Wikipedia. Um, or on a, a, a science database, you can you can find these numbers. There's no particular mystery here. So let's try putting in some numbers. Let's first of all actually calculate what's going to be in the denominator here in both cases, right? Because we're going to use use both. So this is 0 0.2 times 10 to the 3, uh, um, where we got uh, heat capacity times 4.2 times 10 to the 3. Then this is going to be 0 0.8 times 2.6 times 10 to the 3 times 7.4 times 10 to the 2. OK, so this looks a bit complicated and I'm not going to um, bore you with doing things in a calculator. So let's try and see where we got to. This is 0 0.2 times 4.2. So this is going to be 0 0.8 roughly um, times 10 to the 6. So this bit here, that's 10 to the 6, 0.8, so it's 8 times 10 to the 5, OK, this term. Now let's look at this. This is 10 to the 5, OK, that's going to give us 10 to the 5. 0.8 times 7 is about 0.56 or 0.6 times this. What's that going to give us? Um, about 14, 15... This is going to give us something of the order of 12 times 10 to the 5. Um, I maybe let's let's have another sort of think about this. It's going to be about 20, maybe more like 50. You can work it out yourself, right? So we've got 15 times 8. If we add these two together, um, that's about 2.3, maybe 2.4 um, times 10 to the 6. So what we have on the denominator here. I think this is more like 16 when we think about it carefully. So this is about 2.4 times 10 to the 6. 
okay, in appropriate units, right? 16 plus 8 is 24, and then I've gone up by 10 to the 6. So you can check it. Um, may not be precisely right, but it's it's good enough. This is an order of magnitude, remember. Okay, so we've got, got to have the same on the bottom here. It's about 2.4 times 10 to the 6 in, in appropriate units, right? Okay, now let's look at... Um, Let's look at beta first of all. So what do we have at the top here? So we're going to estimate now a value of beta. So beta is of order qt is 10 to the minus 6. c1 is 4.2 times 10 to the 3. All right. And rho 1 is 10 to the 3. Okay. And then we want to divide by my 2.4 times 10 to the six okay so let's see where that gets us all right that's all gonna go so we got 2.4 uh, 4.2 divided by 1.8 uh, that's um a little less than two isn't it so it's about 0.8 times 10 to the minus six and the units here are meters per second okay so how far do we go in a year? So we're going to take a time scale, 10 to the 7 seconds. So that's going to be 3 eighths, that's going to be about 20 metres or so. Let's have a look. So that's going to be 3 times roughly 0 0.8, okay, times 10. So that's 24 metres. So how far we may be moving is about 24 metres. Just a moment. When we had a vection with water displacing oil, right, we were moving 150 metres. This is a lot low lower, right? It's not QT over phi. Okay, QT over phi would be 5 times 10 to the minus 6, not 0.8 times 10 to the minus 6. And why is that? It's because we've got this term here. And this term here, if you look at this, is the dominant term, okay? It slows things down. So we're moving a lot slower. The heat is moving a lot slower than the actual water. So I inject hot water. The water gives up its, its energy, essentially, to the rock. We get a front of, of hot water, and in front of it is cold water, okay? So that's the major conclusion here. But on average, we are moving sort of tens of metres a year. Now let's look at the conduction. Um, we need to now find alpha. Okay, so alpha is going to be 0.2. Okay, times kappa 1, which is 0.6. Okay, plus 0.8 times 3, and that's all going to be divided by my 2.4 times 10 to the 6. Okay, so this is 0 0.12 plus 0 0.24, and that's 0 point... zero point three six over 2.4 times 10 to the 6. Okay, so um, we can divide that by 12, can't we? So that's 0 0.3 over 2 times 10 to the minus 6. So this is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 7. Okay, so, and that's going to be metres squared per second. Okay, so now we don't need to do this square root of 2 alpha t. Okay, so the distance moved is going to be the square root of 2 times alpha times t. So that's going to be the square root of 2 alpha, which is 3 times 10 to the minus 7, times the time, which is 3 times 10 to the plus 7. And we're going to find the square root of all of that, and maybe another colour so that it comes out a bit more. Um, that's going to be 3 metres. Right, because 10 to minus 7 and 3 times 3, so the, the square root was easy. Okay. So what we have here is we're injecting hot water, relatively slow speeds. 
we're going to move, yeah, you know, a few tens of meters in a year. Okay, this could be a natural groundwater flow. It could be something that's pumped, but we're normally talking about tens and maybe um, if it's shallow, shallower subsurface so we can move the fluids actually faster. If we go in the deep subsurface, fluids go slower because uh, of uh, lower permeability. It takes more pressure to get the fluids to move, of course. Um, we're looking at tens of meters in terms of convection and then a few meters in terms of conduction. So if we inject hot water, we may have a waterfront that moves a few tens of meters and then is smeared out over a few meters. And of course, that smearing out of the temperature is going to be obviously necessar necessarily a little bit problematic for heat storage, because when you withdraw it, OK, you've smeared out the temperature. So you no longer withdraw um, water at exactly the same temperature as you injected. But it's less than the convection. It's not insignificant, but it is only a few metres. So now we're going to estimate length and time scales for contaminant transport and heat transport. But let's do the easiest. Imagine there's a solute just dissolved in water. So we're going to consider a case where we've just got water flowing, but there will be a solid. So we've got S1 is one, S2 is zero. So we're not going to consider oil or gas or another phase. And we're going to stick with QT is 10 to the minus six meters per second. And we have a porosity of 0.2. So something that's just going with, with the flow in single phase flow, so something that's just dissolved in the water. And I'm not going to go through the mathematics, but the speed with which you move is just QT over phi. And intuitively, you can see how that happens. If I got just flow in one dimension and say I inject a cubic metre of water in a cross-sectional area of one square metre, the water doesn't move one meter, does it? Because of the porosity. If the porosity is 50%, it actually has to go in two meters of rock, right? The porosity is 0.2, it actually has to go in five meters of rock. So the speed with which something that's simply dissolved in water and doesn't do anything else apart from diffuse um, is just QT over phi. So this is, in this particular example, is five times 10 to the minus six meters per second. We um, are looking at a time scale of about a year. So that's three times 10 to the seven seconds. And so the distance moved just by advection, right? As we've shown, whoops, there's a minus there, is 150 meters. And that's similar to what we did before, right? So we can move of order 100 meters. Now let's look at diffusion. Now we'll talk about diffusion as imagine a solute, so something dissolved in the water. Say it's a contaminant, right? It could be benzene from a petrol spill. It could be something that's just dissolved in the water. It could be salt. It could be salt water intrusion from the sea. Typical diffusion coefficients of the order of about 10 to the minus nine meters squared per second. And it does depend specifically on the substance but it's normally of that order of magnitude. So the amount of smearing due to molecular diffusion in about a year is my 2dt. And that is 2 times 10 to the minus 9 times 3 times 10 to the 7 square root. Now we look here, that's 6 it's the square root, the distance we move, is the square root of 6 times 10 to the minus 2, 0.06. So what's that? It's about 0.2 metres, maybe 0.25 metres, something like that. OK. So molecular diffusion is actually quite slow. So if I'm pumping water and I've got something dissolved in the water, advection will move us, you know, tens, maybe 100 metres in a year. Molecular diffusion is really small in comparison. So it's very unlike the multiphase flow case where actually imbibition as a, quote, diffusive process um, can move you quite a significant distance. Molecular diffusion, not so much.
Okay, so that was the sort of simple case as a base case, but the important thing here is the speed with which the water moves. But now imagine I inject hot water. And now I'm going to look at the speed with which not the water moves, but a hot water front moves. And that's my beta. And then I'm also going to look at heat conduction, which is given by my parameter alpha. So just to recall in previous videos, beta is my speed of conduction. And that is given by QT times the heat capacity times the density. And then it's divided by basically the sort of energy content of both the fluid and the rock. So it's phi C1 rho 1 plus 1 minus phi C solid rho solid. Alpha is the heat conduction of both the solid and the liquid, right? Here it's only the liquid moving, but conduction is in both phases. So it's phi times kappa 1 plus 1 minus phi times kappa solid. And then it's divided by actually the same bunch of terms, rho 1, C1. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate these two terms first. Now, at this point, you need to know the numbers. Um, and of course, you can just look this up, right? Look it up in Wikipedia, right? Or Google it. Okay, so I'm just going to give you typical numbers, right? So this is point two. The heat capacity of water is quite high. It's 4.2 times 10 to the 3. And that's joules per Kelvin per kilogram. Right, the appropriate units. Okay. Row one is the density of water, and that's a thousand, and that's kilograms per cubic meter. Okay. Then we got to add this is point eight, right? One minus five. The heat capacity of a solid, well, what solid are we going to talk about? We're going to assume that we have a quartz as our solid, so this is a sandstone. And then this CS is lower, 7.2 times 10 to the 2. And again, the units are the same. The density, however, is larger. This is 2.6 times 10 to the 3 kilograms per cubic meter. So we've got these terms. OK, now let's go through it. Of course, if you've got a calculator sitting there, you can calculate it directly. Um, I obviously got to sort of estimate it on my feet. So it's 10 to the 6. This is about 0.8 times 10 to the 6 here. This term, that's 10 to the 5. 0.8 times 2.6 is about 2. This is about 15, 16 times 10 to the 6. So I'm not doing this precisely, but this is roughly 2.4 times 10 to the 6. Okay, now um, we can argue about whether or not that's uh, that's completely correct, um, but it's, it's roughly of that order of magnitude, and we'll think about the units in just a moment. Okay, so let's do beta. This is 10 to the minus 6. This we've already done is 4.2 times 10 to the 3, and this is 10 to the 3. So what's on the numerator here? Right. If we if we look at this, this is 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the plus 6, so it's just 4.2. Okay, and then it's got to be divided by this. So the speed with which we move, beta, right, is roughly 4.2 over 2.4 times 10 to the minus 6 meters per second okay well that's um 2.1 over 1.2 that's about 0.8 something like that right 0 0.8 0 0.9 so this is 0.8 times 10 to the minus 6 meters per second now compare it here with the speed of the water okay it's moving much much slower than the water so when i inject hot water the hot water front moves slower than the water itself. So there's hot water, then there's cold water that moves in advance. Okay. 
So how far do we move in a year? Well, we just multiply this by 3 times 10 to the 7. OK, so the distance moved. 10 to the 7, that's a 10. 2.4 is about 24 metres. So we move, you know, a few tens of metres. The heat, the heat front moves, the water moves a lot further, but now it's cooled down. And the reason for this is I inject hot water, it contains energy. As it moves, it has to give energy to the rock, right? It has to heat up the rock, OK? But the water's still moving, right? So the water sort of loses its energy and cold water moves in advance. OK, now how... how um, how much do you spread out due to conduction? So, oh, we need to calculate this term, don't we? So that's point two. Water. Now, what's the thermal conductivity of water? Um, that's about 0.6 watts per meter um, per Kelvin. Is that the right units? Let's think about that. Um, we'll think about that later, right? But the, the units are definitely, no, what, what's um, per metre? OK, and then this is 0.8, OK? And then they have the thermal conductivity of um, the solid. Now, with a solid, this is interesting. Quartz actually has a very high thermal conductivity. So in these units, it's three here. Most other solids will have a much lower thermal conductivity. So when we're looking at how much we move um, by conduction, this is going to be very much an upper upper estimate. OK, so let's actually um, check on our units here, right, so that uh, we get everything right. So rho has units of kilograms per cubic metre. And heat capacity, here we've already done, is joules per kelvin per kilogram. So what's on the denominator is joules per cubic metre per kilogram. Alpha, we know, has the units of metre squared per second. It's a diffusivity. OK, so we have kappa. What we've actually got now is we've got metres cubed. OK. We've got joules here. OK, and we've got Kelvin. So what do we have to multiply this by? This has to be joules per second, which is watts. OK, and then we got to divide by metres and divide by Kelvin. So I was right the first time. It's watts per metre per Kelvin. OK, apologise for that. OK, so this is a three here, but it's always useful to check as you go along, right? So this is a useful thing. Wow, I got the units right. Yes, so it's, it's watts per metre per Kelvin. So this is 0.12. This is actually quite small. So the thermal conductivity through the water doesn't actually make much um, because this is the big term. This is 2.4. So this is about 2.5 here. So alpha right, on the top here, right, if we look at this, is 2.5 divided by, oh, what was this term? That was 2.4 times 10 to the 6. So it's roughly 10 to the minus 6 metres squared per second. OK. So now let's work out how far you move by conduction. This is 2 alpha t. This is basically the standard deviation of that error function, right? So we're not doing complex maths. It's just sort of putting numbers in, right? You can do this with a calculator, but it just gives you an idea, right? So rather than sort of worrying about how do I plot up an error function, this just gives you the amount that you've smeared. So if we look at that, OK, we've got 2 times 10 to the minus 6 times 3 times 10 to the 7. We take the square root. That's the square root of 60. OK, we're looking at something that's the order of 7 to 8 metres. So it's actually quite significant. So if we're injecting hot water into a sandstone, over about a year, the temperature front will be smeared over several metres. If we actually have other rock or sediment that is not quartz, right, sort of mud or clay-like sediments, actually this value is much lower. So this is very much an upper limit. So what this means, if you if we've got room for a little schematic here, right, if we're looking at distance here, let's imagine we're just looking at the water. 
So we've injected water that contains, I don't know, a tracer. What? Contains, I don't know, something dissolved in the water. So how the waterfront moves, right, this is of the order of 150 metres. The tracer will have molecular diffusion, so it will be spread out over a tiny distance, right, about 0.25 metres. Right, you hardly notice it. So that's the basically the concentration. But what about the temperature? Temperature, imagine it's cold water here and it's hot water here. The temperature will have moved only 24 metres, right? One sixth of the distance, more or less, roughly. And then it will be smeared out but it's actually smeared out over quite a significant distance here, right? This is sort of seven or eight metres, right? Now, maybe less because you don't have pure quartz, but, you know, not, not insignificant. So you've got some temperature smeared out, and, of course, that's a problem if we want to then take back the hot water, right? If we're storing hot water for a cold day, OK, we're not going to get back, you know, nice sharp front of water. We're actually going to be sort of getting some lukewarm water back. Um, so it is significant, but it's not so bad that it's everything is completely smeared out. So this hopefully gives you some idea of how to sort of get an order of magnitude, get a sense of what's going on. Obviously, you can solve the partial differential equations properly and do precise calculations. But it's always useful to get a, you know, make sure you've got your units right, put your numbers together and at least get an order of magnitude of what's going on.